listener to another episode of The Passenger, the channel that aims to bring you first-hand accounts from past travelogues. Today's episode is special. We'll have the honor and rare luck to be initiated into the journey by the author in person, Dr. Naomi F. Collins. In her book, Through Dark Days and White Nights, we can find a unique account of an American woman living in the Soviet Union over four decades. It was a real pleasure to craft this episode together, and I'm very thankful for Dr. Naomi's enthusiasm and kindness. Let's get into it with Dr. Naomi F. Collins. What a shock it was to arrive in the then Soviet Union in 1965 to live in the dormitories of Moscow State University. And what another huge shock it was 26 years later to witness the end of the Soviet Union when my husband Jim was in charge of the American embassy. Nothing in studying history had prepared me to experience such dramatic changes, and I felt compelled to write what I observed for those in the future trying to make sense of this past. I focused on everyday life because most books don't. And, as it turns out, Russia made news then and continues to do so today. So, don't forget to subscribe and enjoy the show. Quote. When we transferred to the Chopin Express in Vienna, we found ourselves on a first-class Soviet train, headed through Czechoslovakia and Poland to Russia. Crossing through the Iron Curtain, we entered another realm. Between 4 and 5 a.m., uniformed border guards burst into our compartment, shining bright flashlights into our eyes to jolt us awake. They barked commands that we knew meant they wanted to see our passports and other papers. Other officials searched everywhere. In some cases, they seized personal items. They didn't feel they had to explain themselves. At the Soviet border city of Brest, the train halted. We were hauled out of the train, rounded up, and dragged from place to place to fill out forms, organize trunks, and try to obtain a train ticket from the border to Moscow, with little success. Inexplicably, we were locked into a small one-room station house for reasons we never learned. Were they trying to avoid contaminating the local population, seeking smugglers or simply harassing foreigners? With the help of a porter, paid a small gratuity, could that have been the issue? And after a lot of shouting, we acquired the tickets and re-entered the train. I felt anxious and unsettled. Meanwhile, the train had its wheels changed. At all borders of the Soviet Union, the train wheels had to be changed to fit the broader gauge of the Soviet tracks. European tracks featured the narrower gauge. Although this seemed at first a whimsical, wasteful or foolish oddity, or lack of planning, I learned it was none of these, but rather another kind of planning a strategic effort to prevent trains from most of Europe from driving straight into the heart of the Soviet Union. As impenetrable as a fortress wall, the wide-gauge tracks halted invasion by train. This was my first exposure to a larger world in which the experience of war and peace shaped people's thinking, plans and lives. While the train raced hour after hour at high speed across Soviet lands, I began to grasp what Napoleon confronted when he attempted to conquer these Russian lands on horseback and foot, lands that were to conquer him instead. I pictured the settings of World War I and II 
This was just 24 years from the 1941 invasion by Hitler's armies advancing into Russia. And this was still before the first snowfall of winter. After ten days at sea and three more on trains, Jim and I finally arrived in Moscow on September 13, 1965. I was 23, he 26. We had been married for two years. We were relieved to be greeted by professionally chipper Russian students equipped with a van to collect us with our baggage for our trip to the dormitory. After showing us to our dorm suite on our arrival, our student hosts toured the corridors with us, past the locked lounge, to the common kitchen down the hall. This room would bring us together with our neighbors, too cautious to come to our room or invite us to theirs. The next day I realized I would have to shop. I had heard so much about cues I thought I understood why they formed. A desirable but scarce product showed up people lined up to buy it. There was hardly a day when U.S. newspapers hadn't shown pictures of Russians standing in line, as if standing in line were part of who Russians were, the people of the queue, victims of the failure of communist rule. But although the reasons did include the failures of central state planning, they also turned out to be more structural and strange. The first store I entered had separate counters for cheeses, sausages and cold cuts and hacked up parts of cows, pigs and lambs. Without refrigeration, these foods emitted pungent sour smells. First, I went to the cheese counter, waiting my turn, while others elbowed their way in front of me, sometimes screaming at me in the process. At my turn, I managed to request in careful Russian and converting to metric system at the same time a half kilo of Golansky, Dutch or Edam cheese, about one pound. A sturdy woman in a dirty apron cut, waited and wrapped my piece of cheese in a newspaper page, called out the price, 79 kopecks, and gave me a slip to take to the cashier. I then waited in the cashier's line gave her the slip, which she impaled on a spike, took my money and gave me a new slip, with which I returned to the cheese line to claim my cheese. Three lines. One half kilo of cheese. I shuddered to picture gathering the rest of the groceries. It seemed the perpetual Russian cues could be as much about plenty as scarcity. They were about systemic inefficiency and systematic control of consumer demand. And they worked. People's expectations for variety and freshness were not high, nor did they normally seek to buy great quantities. The possibility of stocking up with a loaded shopping cart at a self-service grocery was completely unimagined and about 30 years into the future. The restaurant's printed menus aroused immediate hope of rich variety and plenty. Well-worn menus listed dozens of hot and cold salads, appetizers, soups, entrees and desserts. Pages of apparent choices far more extensive than any fare the establishment offered. But when one tried to order, the waitress informed the hopeful eater, we have beef steak and chicken Kiev. Then, more impatiently, in Russian, Stovam, what do you want? I couldn't figure out then or since why anyone thought that highlighting so large a gap between potential plenty and actual scarcity, falling so visibly short of a professed goal, seemed desirable propaganda for the success of the regime. But most likely, the two bureaucracies, the one that created and printed menus and the one that stocked restaurants, never met 
Or perhaps the missing food items could be accounted for in some other way. Rumor had it then, as later, that desirable foods went missing en route, off the farm, dropped from the truck, from the warehouse, or out of the back door of the kitchen. Winter came. Our room faced north in a straight line to the Arctic. Icy winds rattled our double windows and leaked in around the edges, freezing the sausages sitting on the inside sill. The winter of 1965 and 1966 was one of the coldest winters in Russian history, a history not lacking in cold. For a long spell, the temperatures dipped down around 40 degrees below zero, rising sometimes only to zero Fahrenheit. When accompanied by cutting winds and frozen fog, air filled with suspended droplets of ice, it seemed even colder. When I walked the mile walk from the metro station to the dorm, ice crystals formed on my eyelashes, and everything around me glittered as I viewed the world through this diamond dust. I had followed my husband, Jim, to Russia. We were not idealists nor ideologues, just graduate students. Jim had majored in Russian history and literature at Harvard College, then in Russian studies at Indiana University's graduate school. He had succeeded in his application to become an exchange student to the Soviet Union under the Inter-University Committee on Travel Grants Awards. At the time, this was virtually the only way for an American to study in the USSR. I was a PhD candidate in history and had agreed to go along for the company and experience. And so I became in Moscow, an unintentional observer of an incomprehensible land. When I reimagined the times, I pictured the United States we left behind, led by President Lyndon Johnson, building up troops and war efforts in Vietnam. Johnson, having filled President John Kennedy's term after his assassination in 1963, was one year into his own term as elected president. Meanwhile, popular culture was taking a new turn with the advent of the Beatles. Beatles invade America, one headline read, and miniskirts appearing on the scene for the first time elicited headlines, debates, and cartoons. In the Soviet Union in which we landed, Leonid Brezhnev ruled as first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and later as its general secretary. He had ousted Nikita Khrushchev from that position about a year before we arrived. Virtually all visual and visible signs of Khrushchev's period, his legacy and rule, had been totally obliterated. It was as if he never existed. Very eerie. Brezhnev's rule meant not only the disappearance of Khrushchev and his reforms, but also a return to communist orthodoxy and hardening of the Cold War atmosphere. Soviet Union is now using spy satellites, was another headline of the time. I heard an urgent knocking on the door. I opened it to a group of highly agitated North Vietnamese students whom we had previously met in the shared kitchen. North Vietnam was at the time an enemy of the US. I had met the students one day when I had walked into the kitchen and heard an Arab student exhorting Vietnam is your country, not the Americans. I focused on watching a pot of water come to the boil. Meanwhile, the Arab student left the kitchen. In the silence, one of the Vietnamese fellows turned to me and asked, Where are you from? Uncertain of the reaction I would receive, I affected poise and replied, I am an American. He smiled and responded cheerfully about his studies in Russia and other small talk. After that, whenever Jim and I met this young man in the halls or kitchen, 
They always exchanged friendly greetings. I'm not sure I know why. So when I opened the door that evening, the only mystery was what was agitating them. In accented Russian, they said, Your husband is in trouble in the kitchen. Come quickly to help. He's making explosions. My heart rate ratcheted up. Of course, I followed them. Reaching the kitchen, I peered in quickly, only to find a cheerful Jim, happily popping popcorn. With some popping corn he had shipped with us, he was using a small covered pot over a hot flame. It did become a tradition for the rest of the year. At the first sound and smells of popping corn, they would show up in the kitchen. And if they didn't, Jim would knock on their door with a bowl of freshly popped corn. We spent many evenings sitting around, talking with fellow students, drinking tea and eating popcorn and cookies. We came to know Anna, the serious, down-to-earth student of philology, a small woman with large brown eyes and brown hair. She was both intrigued and cautious in her visits. We also talked girl talk, including about health problems. She, like most Russian women I then met, knew little about the functioning of the female body. For Anna, this was not academic, as she suffered a great deal, even becoming bedridden, but without the benefit of good medical diagnosis, care or cure. Sadly, we watched her and other friends and their families suffer from conditions or illnesses we thought would have been easily addressed in the States helped by antibiotics or aspirin or other medications we took for granted, but were not available there. Friends, assigned to us by the Office of Foreign Students, came by frequently, with enthusiasm and apparent sincerity, hoping we'd spend more time socializing with them. But that didn't happen. I knew that Nina had a job reporting our activities, views, and weaknesses to the KGB. Her father was a local Communist Party bigwig, and she, with her strong determination, lack of scruples, and a focus on her mission, was set on a career path to success. I sympathized with her ambition and tenacity, but was uncomfortable with her prying and intrusive questions. Raised to be a good girl, and still not very worldly. I didn't know how to cope with this unwelcome relationship, so I remained courteous, but distant and unforthcoming. Fortunately, Ivan was less persistent and sometimes even appeared reluctant or ashamed. If much of our time in Moscow, I felt irritated or insulted by the students whose job it was to spy on us, and report back to the authorities what they learned about us. By the end of our stay, I was more pained and saddened than irked by the plight. Right before we left, some friends told us their stories. They revealed their nightmare lives. They knew they lived in the shadows because their mother or father, grandmother or grandfather, had been incarcerated in a prison or labor camp for reasons either known or unclear to them, but without a real trial or possibility of parole. Dark family secrets. The parents, whose sins they were paying, had been punished not for murder, theft, rape or fraud, but for political views or expression deemed unacceptable to the authorities, or for simply being in the wrong class or wrong place at the wrong time. The children were marked for life with this disability. As young students, they had tried to walk a careful path. They had hidden their political liability from strangers, but were still stalked by their history in files and records. At some point, a reasonable-looking official had approached them unexpectedly with a lifetime choice to terminate their education and get employment in a coal mine far from a major city or other unpalatable opportunity, or to attend a highly selective national university in a major city 
master foreign languages, sciences, and other fields, and look forward to a promising professional career. The price of choosing the university path was to report back regularly the activities, relationships, character flaws, and vulnerabilities of foreign students whom they must befriend. On April 20, Mr. C at the American Embassy, Moscow, summoned us to tell us that a Russian who jumped ship and defected to the Philippines had given Jim's name as a reference. The facts no longer mattered. Whether we knew him or not was inconsequential. What mattered was that we might be subject to arrest, vulnerable for supposedly aiding his defection. We already believed that the Soviets had for some time wanted to rid themselves of Jim's presence. This event provided an opportunity. I was desperate to leave Russia immediately. Our last night in the dormitories, Wednesday, April 20, 1966. The tilted chair we had wedged between the door handle and floor to barricade ourselves in, as we had seen done in movies, had given the room an unsettling look. A cockroach lurking in the shadow of the radiator had watched us. We had almost convinced ourselves that this barricade and our careful breathing could protect us from arrest and imprisonment by the KGB. Although the long hallways outside the room were empty, I imagined I heard footsteps approaching. Escape was all I could think of. Like Joseph K. in Kafka's The Trial, I felt we had been framed. Unlike Joseph K., we had some idea of what the accusations would be, but knew our innocence would make no difference. We too would be incarcerated, captive to the capricious will of arbitrary forces. It was the longest night of my life. Exhausted by morning, we left empty-handed as advised, avoiding suspicion, acting normal. I knew at the time that our futures hinged on how convincingly nonchalant we appeared walking from our rooms into the car the embassy had sent. After a silent ride to the airport, with nothing but our coats and a few dollars in our pockets, Mr. C deposited us on an airplane bound for Warsaw, Paris and London. Our stay in Moscow ended abruptly, unexpectedly and dramatically, before we ever witnessed the warmth of spring. Some of my reaction might today be ascribed to culture shock, a term that emerged into popular use only after that time. From what I heard from Russians, it appeared that many also suffered some degree of helplessness in the face of unchecked power hopelessness in the face of a future over which they exercised little control. Cynicism for survival was, as always, rampant. The popular Russian joke is still shared today. A man in an ambulance asks the attendant, Where are we going? The attendant replies, To the morgue. The patient responds quickly, But I'm not dead yet to which the attendant retorts, and we are not there yet either. Although I had not planned to live in Russia again, delusional I must have been, Jim's official State Department orders of August 1973 included Jim's generic dependent wife and two dependent sons, Robert and Jonathan, five and two years old. I was now 31, eight years older than when I had gone to Moscow at 23 for the first time. Suddenly, I had to anticipate two years' worth of birthday candles and toilet paper, flour, coffee, Christmas wrap, paper clips, 
rubber bands, saran wrap, and tide. It required little snowsuits off-season, shoes for feet to grow into. Sanitary napkins, multiplied. Family planning measures, estimated. How do other women do this, I wondered, feeling very insufficient. My mind, that had interpreted back over three centuries of history for my PhD, seemed unable to project forward to two years' worth of goods for everyday living for four people. In the States, I was grateful for many things. The comforts and luxuries of daily life provided regular pleasures. Watching the little boys play freely in the yard, turning the taps to reliable 24-hour hot and cold running water, steady electricity, a daily newspaper, the texture and colors of lettuce, tomatoes and celery, apples and oranges, and even eggplants, artichokes, avocados, peaches, pears and nectarines, cherries, berries and grapes, fresh milk, a dishwasher, and yes, Sesame Street, children's movies, shows, and a special children's section of the local library. I still picture the world of 1973. Richard Nixon was president of the United States and Leonid Brezhnev leader of the then Soviet Union. It was a somewhat better time in US-Soviet relations than it had been in the mid-60s during the hardening of the Cold War. People called it the era of détente, a period of agreement and cooperation. At the same time, the Senate began Watergate hearings in 1973 that led to Nixon's resignation in 1974. The Soviet Union expelled the writer Solzhenitsyn and lost the ballet star Baryshnikov to defection. Jim was assigned to serve as a political officer in the external political section of the embassy. He was to focus on the relationship between the Soviet Union and Third World nations, that is, Soviet policy concerning Latin America, Africa and the Middle East. It was the last of these that truly absorbed his time and energy. We arrived in Moscow on August 13, 1973, to the welcome site of a large three-bedroom apartment in a new building, formed by combining two Russian apartments. At the time, an average Russian family would likely have had three generations. Grandma, parents, one or two children living in each half of this apartment, even in this privileged suburban neighborhood. Housing was still the Soviet's tightest commodity, creating a pressure cooker of demand as packed together people became heated and volatile. To ramp up a family's standard of living, members wove a complex set of relationships for barter, exchange and favors among people in a host of positions in different sectors of the economy. More than a simple swap, and beyond triangular trade, the network of people worked an intricate system of IOUs that could mark the difference between living off the regular economy and the more tony, opulent life, outside what the state had in store for you. It helped to be a communist party official or a well-placed person in an important profession. Then, along with the paycheck, came the valued coupons. These vouchers allowed access to an expenditure at special stores for diplomats and for privileged and select classes of Soviet people. The chain of shops called Bereski Birches, accepted only hard currency valuta, the world's convertible currencies of dollars, pound sterling, marks and French and Swiss francs. By the 1970s, some Soviets who traveled abroad could obtain hard currencies and convert these to coupons for access. Others, with the luck to receive hard currency from family abroad, could also obtain coupons to purchase special goods 
while the Soviet state stockpiled dollars, sterling and other valuable monies that did not allow citizens to hold. Serving the needs of the privileged people with foreign currencies created another job category. Black marketeers, businessmen, could obtain those modern European kitchen cabinets, the Italian suit and silk tie, the refrigerator or washer. Meanwhile, those that ran the black market accumulated capital and connections that positioned them well for the new post-Soviet era when it arrived unexpectedly many years later. Equality within the professed classless society Karl Marx sought and Vladimir Lenin advertised stopped with access. Unadulterated privilege. If money rather than bureaucracy decided who would obtain scarce goods and services, Soviet political leaders would have lost their greatest instrument of control. Economics 101 comes to mind that money has no inherent value beyond what it can buy in goods and services, generate in interest or dividends, or leverage in credit. Communist leaders actively prevented these uses of money, and none was to happen soon. In this strange economy, car parts had disproportionate value. When an American friend went to the car factory to attempt to buy wiper blades to replace those stolen from his Russian car, the clerk opened his locked metal safe to procure the wiper blades, while the unlocked drawer of his desk overflowed with piles of loose cash. Most drivers simply locked their wiper blades in their glove compartments when it wasn't raining. When it rained, they jumped out of their cars at the first red light to pop the blades back onto the wipers, at least on the driver's side. The outside mirrors had greater intrinsic value than their use as car parts. At first, I was baffled about why these mirrors were stolen so quickly from any vehicle without, it seemed, finding their way onto another vehicle. Then we saw, at the Bolshoi Theater, ladies opening their purses to powder their noses. There they were, the missing side-view mirrors, now serving as cosmetic mirrors, a product otherwise unobtainable. No surprise that some 15 years later, ST Lauder was one of the first companies to enter the new Russia. The competition for survival in a world of unpredictable, irrational distribution of goods made daily life exasperating. Foreigners, including me, were not unique in feeling hassled and testy. Road rage ruled the public space and appeared to cause constant irritation to almost everyone, yet was also perpetuated by almost everyone, seemed self-defeating. Another street scene I still picture. Driving home one day on a wide, busy main boulevard, rough and bumpy, with hidden entries and exits, and unreliable traffic lights, trolleys speeding by on their tracks on my left, plenty to think about as a driver, with toddlers in the back seat, I saw right in front of me a man's head pop out of a manhole. No warning, just a head at ground level in the middle of a heavily traveled road. I probably screamed some bleep word. Strangely, he seemed more surprised to see me than I him. It's hard to know what he expected or where he thought he'd emerge. Good thing I swerved. Joking aside, which it rarely was, what Russians relied on and savored and what added color to the gray background of life were day-to-day -day reliabilities and slowly increasing prosperity. Gradually, although not consistently, more clothes, fabrics, fruits, cars, refrigerators and telephones appeared. 
much more was available now than in the 60s. Jim, never one to dally, began to work at the embassy the morning after our arrival. It was the October 1973 Ayam Kapoor War, in which Egyptians attacked and launched a war against Israel during Israel's major holy day, but suffered defeat in the process. The diplomatic repercussions gave Jim his first challenges. The Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, began a series of visits to Moscow aimed at convincing the Soviet government to help shift the Arab-Israel conflict from the battlefield to the negotiating table. Jim, as the embassy Middle East watcher, worked relentlessly to digest what his Arab and Soviet contacts had to say. So much information gathering occurred outside the office that dinners, luncheons and cocktail parties were required business rather than the social occasions they might have appeared. Conversation for the officers turned quickly to the Suez Canal, arms control and treaties. Meanwhile, reporters for American newspapers and weekly news magazines asked Jim what was going on, and he in turn asked them the same question. Between them, they developed material to report home to their newspaper, magazine or government. Our first summit conference turned out to be President Nixon's last. The June 1974 meeting was part of a regular series held between President Nixon and the General Secretary of the Communist Party, Leonid Brezhnev. Jim's junior status gave him responsibility for sharing a 24-hour shift at the Kremlin with another young officer. In this role, Jim got to prepare Nixon's room meet with his staff and secret service, and most memorably, to put the toilet paper roll, the imported American paper, on the spool in the president's bathroom. To cover the 12-hour special assignment, Jim worked almost around the clock for a week, sleeping about three hours between 2 and 5 a.m. There was no extra pay or any comp time to recompense for lost nights, but he certainly learned things they hadn't taught him in school, nor did he imagine his job description might include the bottom end of a president. When not attending or producing cocktail receptions or dinners three to five nights a week, what did I do, beside housework, shopping, cooking and caring for two little boys? The role of a traditional foreign service wife might fill a book, or at least a chapter. I straddled the old and new roles for women, landing more often on the new side before it became a paved road, accumulating some bruises from the bumps. In 1973, I vented to my journal observations I never mailed to friends, fearing my views might jeopardize Jim's career. American foreign service wives abroad are expected, on the one hand, to be sufficiently independent to cope with snakes and earthquakes, amoebic dysentery and other parasites, wartime evacuations from countries in upheaval, giving birth alone in a strange city, and traveling alone with children across strange continents. And, on the other hand, to be sufficiently dependent and accommodating to serve their husband's position, blend in quietly and not seek a professional life of their own. In fact, I liked to cook, host and attend events, meet new people, keep up the conversational exchanges, contribute what I could, volunteer. But the rotating lunches were business meetings for officers only. I prepared and served the meal, nothing unusual about that, except that I was not to participate in a meal. I did not sit at a table, I was not spoken to. I served each course, left the room cleared the plates, served the next course. I felt more servant than host. I expect I was overly sensitive, but felt humiliated, and also trapped in a familiar conundrum, caught between what I felt to be my self-respect, professional life, PhD and career, and my reluctance to risk harming Jim's career, hurting something so important to him.
Of course, women have long since moved out of the kitchen and from behind typewriters into diplomatic slots in the foreign service and have become ambassadors and secretaries of state. It seemed odd at the time to reconcile these practices with the professed American foreign policy to promote equality, democracy, rights and freedom throughout the world. At the time, Russian women were also grappling with the issues of their lives. Although feminist theory was then emerging in Western countries, I wrote my American friends that I was not interested so much in theory as in the gap I saw between the official Soviet propaganda boasting how liberated Russian women were against the reality of women's status and lives. Highlighting hypocrisy, I wrote to friends on International Women's Day, March 8, 1975. Since many people worldwide seem to accept the Soviets' self-appointed role as guardians and torchbearers of women's rights, I feel obligated to dispel some myths. The women the Soviets speak of when they discuss liberation are not the majority of women. About half the Soviet population is still rural. The lives of rural women are exhausting even to imagine. The vast majority of urban women have neither the luxury of being homemakers, supported by men, nor the power of being equal in the political and career arenas. Many are, as they've always been, the unskilled and heavy labor force of Russia, the drudges of an undeveloped country. With industrialization, women moved from the fields to the factories, road gangs and construction crews, where they work for male foremen, male machine operators and male managers. Professions that draw women, like medicine and teaching, do not reflect the importance of women, but rather the limited value and low pay assigned to those professions. Women have small representation in the Supreme Soviet, the unrepresentative parliament, in which even men have no power. In a society in which very few people wield power at all, virtually all of those who do are not women. Some women, especially after they had children, might have preferred a break from career ambition and success, the option of stay-at-home wife and mother, supported by a male breadwinner. That may be in the future for the privileged class, I then wrote. But for now, women are raised knowing their future is in full-time salaried employment along with full-time domestic duties. The life of Masha, for example, was strenuous even compared to that of an American career woman, wife and mother. She worked full-time in a job without power or privilege and returned home to a husband who not only avoided helping but also knew he was justified in his ease. Men don't do those things. She was not unique, yet she felt fortunate to have a husband, because so many of her friends with children did not. Shopping for basic food and clothing for her family without supermarkets, department stores and easy availability of most items, and all those separate queues, could take her two hours a day and all of her weekends. Women had a long way to go before achieving power and equality at work, help at home, freedom from daily drudgery and the benefits of household technologies, no matter what the Soviets boasted at international conferences. I left Moscow in July 1975 with mixed feelings. After three years living in Soviet Moscow at that point, I realized that only a short-term visitor might have the audacity to believe that she or he could understand the country. The more we saw, the more ambiguous and complex it became. Curiouser and curiouser. For instance, take the issue of radiation. Nobody then knew, or knows today, 
exactly why microwave radiation was and is used on embassy windows from sites in the embassy vicinity, but media assumed and still believe it to be an attempt to monitor, read and intercept embassy communications. I heard from a high-level embassy official, as they say, a story I still visualize. One day, he told me years later, when I arrived at the embassy office, I found an unconnected fluorescent light fixture all lit up. Only, it was not yet hooked up to the electric wires and circuit. This spooked him. The official US position has been that the levels aimed at Americans were below the levels considered safe by our Environmental Protection Agency. We never knew for sure, but we did know that the levels were above those the Russians themselves deemed safe, and so we had to deal with the gap between the official view of harmlessness and our observation that a considerable number of young adults who worked at the embassy developed cancer. In one young couple with a five-year-old child, both developed cancer. One died. Yet the US government position never changed. There were gaps to bridge between what Russia was about and what I could convey, between professed ideology and daily reality among layers of realities. I see from my notes at the time that the Soviet nation's future already looked uncertain and unknowable. We thought then that the regime was losing the emotional commitment of many Russians and earning the indifference of others. Profound interest in seeing the regime continue indefinitely was waning. But secrecy Isolation and powerful central government control would make change very difficult. What the leaders there knew is that any let up in their vigilance would have unpredictable and uncontrollable results that might challenge their absolute power. Nobody knew the ideas that would be published by an uncensored press. <laughs> Jim and I were reassigned to Russia in October 1990, 15 years from when we had last left and 25 years from when we had arrived for the first time in 1965. George H. W. Bush was President of the United States and Jack Matlock was Ambassador. Jim had been summoned to Russia to serve as DCM, Deputy Chief of Mission. His term was to run from October 31st, 1990 to November 1993. During this period, Bill Clinton succeeded George H. W. Bush as president in January 1993. When Jim and I arrived, it was clear that the cold adversarial relationship between the US and Russia, the late motif of our experience living in Russia in the past, was warming. The Berlin Wall had come down, and talk of the Cold War was ending. Although there were large, complex elements propelling this evolution in Russia and in the US relationship with Russia, I was struck by how quickly previously unimaginable things were now occurring on the ground. Gorbachev, in his attempts at reform, worked on a restructuring plan for the Soviet Union. His plan for the previous five years had been to reorganize the relations between the central and regional governments, the national government in Moscow and the governments of the republics. Restructuring, or perestroika in Russian, continued to be his goal. 
So was economic reform, already visible in the startup co-op shops and restaurants springing up around town. Meanwhile, traditional, usually predictable, newspapers, TV and radio had become less controlled and less predictable, freer to speak out. Change was obvious and outcomes uncertain. Nobody knew what was going on or to talk about it. The Soviet Union was becoming part of the rest of the world, emerging from a time warp generations behind the rest of Europe. Caught between eras, Russia was now rich in anomalies. While Americans evolved from manual to automatic cash registers and then to calculators and computers, the Russians were still using the abacus as the instrument of calculation, even in the major state bank. A country with satellite dishes but no telephone extensions, of man on the moon but no aspirin, detergent, paper clips or penicillin, and of brain surgery in hospitals without running hot water. There were decades to leapfrog. We had returned to a revolution, a time of major dislocation and genuine uncertainty. The question in the air was, where are we going? I was eager to see Odessa, after all I had heard of it from those in New York who originated there. Odessa seemed a happier city than Moscow, a mix of Russian, Mediterranean and Aegean ambience. This Black Sea port city was blessed with tree-lined boulevards and the grand, excessive architecture of 19th century merchants. No fans, no screens, certainly no air conditioning. The shops, hotels and restaurants were steamy. Everyone was sweating. Like other Soviet cities in summer, Odessa stank of warm meat, milk, fish and cheese, and of sweat-soaked bodies and clothing. An arts and music city, Odessa had a magnificent, ornate opera house and a stately concert hall. Theatres including a Yiddish musical theatre and at least two small art museums. The archaeological museum abounded in unique objects from Black Sea sites, prehistoric, Scythian gold, ancient Greek, Hellenistic and Byzantine glass, pottery, carvings, crafts. Amazingly, these irreplaceable objects were in badly lit rooms without benefit of climate control equipment or humidity calibration. The windows wide open to sun wind and suit, and the security detail was one five-foot-high middle-aged woman sitting in each room, reading. For years I had wondered at this endless supply of middle-aged women, one per room in each museum, who kept one eye on visitors, one on their book or knitting. Later I learned that they were often teachers or curators retired at 55 but without adequate pensions and happy for these positions, which at least kept them off their feet, indoors and warm in winter. Walking the boulevard along the sea, we met an old man. Like an ancient mariner, he became our guide. Commenting that he had nothing else to do, his wife had died and he lived alone. He accompanied us for the afternoon. He claimed to be 95 years old. Even factoring in the margin of error, he was not young and could recall the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. He showed us gardens and halls of the aristocrats and merchants of Tsarist days, places at which they had danced the nights away before the revolution. Continuing to recount his life, he commented on the hard times during each of the world wars, the starvation and gratuitous destruction, the man serving in the military and being killed. More agitated, he reported that women had been tied to wooden plows like oxen to harrow fields. When we parted, he turned philosophical commenting that he was not really sure 
through all these eras that things had gotten any better. But then he tried to remain hopeful. I'll never forget our small odyssey in Odessa, a surprising little city. Summer, 1991. If I were making a movie about Moscow, the summer of the coup attempt, I would begin with the summit conference shortly before it. In preparation for this summit and during the meetings, Jim worked almost around the clock. The July 1991 summit was part of a series of meetings between Bush and Gorbachev. The agenda focused heavily on arms control, the development of new economic relations between the USSR and the West, and the reshaping of Europe after German reunification. At the summit dinner hosted by President George H.W. Bush on July 31st, Jim was seated at the head table with Presidents Bush and Gorbachev. Jim had escorted into the dining room and was then seated with Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin, then the president of the Russian Republic, the most powerful republic in the Soviet Union of republics, was headquartered in the huge White House across the street from the US Embassy compound. I can still picture President Yeltsin standing with me during social pleasantries. What a massive person. Huge hands and feet, not at all delicate. The proverbial Russian bear. A man with the Washington habit of looking over the shoulder of the person he is talking to, seeing who else is in the room. Or at least looking over my shoulder to spot the better use of his time. Or perhaps, at his height, I'd guess six foot six or six foot seven, he couldn't help looking right over my 64 inches. At dinner, I watched from a small distance President Gorbachev, a man radiating a strong, self-contained presence, clearly a complex, controlled person. I was seated at a nearby table, protocol prohibits proximate spouses, with the Vice President of the Soviet Union, Gennady Yanayev, the President of Armenia, the President of the Upper House of the Soviet Parliament, Jim Baker's wife Susan, the poet Andrei Voznesensky, and others. Conversation went as well as could be expected among people who have little in common, may never meet again, and in some cases do not speak the same language. Gennady Yanayev struck me as remote and opaque and hardly likable, although I had no idea he was in the midst of plotting to betray Gorbachev. President George H.W. Bush's cheerful, perhaps predictable remarks for the toast were upbeat. Gorbachev spoke briefly too, but I was especially struck by his comments, alluding to the complexity of human events, uncertainties of history, and the unknowability of outcomes. With large changes on their way, Gorbachev left to vacation in the South. Ambassador Matlock returned to Washington and Jim was left in charge of the embassy, the chargee. Boris Yeltsin did not vacation that August, nor did the head of the KGB and other hardline communist counter-revolutionary plotters. For some months, from the late fall of 1990 on, counter-revolutionary forces had been coalescing. Devaluation of the Russian currency over the next year rendered 100 ruble notes almost worthless, sending shockwaves through the economy and traumatizing individual citizens and families. It wasn't just an abstract currency that was devalued, but people's actual worth, their savings and hopes for the future suddenly and starkly diminished. Gorbachev? increasingly found himself pressured from at least two sides. Conservative Communist Party members, hoping to prevent the destruction of the entire Soviet communist regime, party, government and economy. 
and popular momentum towards installing less cautious and limited, more profound and far-reaching reform. In an attempt to halt continuing and threatening change, including a new constitution Gorbachev was drafting, and in the context of growing food shortages, conservative hardliners in the Soviet government resolved to oust Gorbachev from power. By the time the coup leaders had advanced their plan for takeover in August 1991, Yeltsin felt himself in a position to stand up to them, to refuse to recognize their authority to oust Gorbachev. A dramatic showdown took place, right outside our windows, just over our garden wall. No one at the time knew that this coup attempt might not succeed. As a historian, I found my duty and calling and a way of quelling my fear in writing what I saw and thought in Moscow during those tumultuous days, caught there, additionally, as wife of the Chargi. On Monday morning, August 19, at 8 a.m., Jim telephoned me from his office. He told me that Gorbachev had been ousted. I felt a chill, knowing that something dramatic would happen. Somehow, I had felt since the previous November that something was brewing. Of course, I could not document what it was and had no idea of what would happen, only that the air carried expectancy and uncertainty. Jim told me I should not leave the embassy compound. I realized suddenly that, however shaken I had felt, Jim must have been equally tense. He was the person officially in charge. Washington was asleep. After all my years living in the closed society Russia had always been, I could hardly believe that outside information was so available now. Each time I turned the set on, I wondered if CNN International would still be there. It was. Steve Hurst was broadcasting to the world, while video cameras relayed images of tanks rolling past the CNN studio, toward us. There was certainly something very convincing about the presence of these tanks. Tanks make a distinctive statement, an ominous low rumble I'll never forget. They advanced heavily and slowly, chewing up the pavement they covered. It appeared at the time that the KGB, military and right-wing forces might be taking complete control of the city, restoring the past and killing the new future. It was now getting close to noon on Monday, August 19th. A growing crowd of Russians was miling and chanting in the small square that separated our house from the Russian Federation building, the White House, as it was called. Jim popped into our house about noon and picked up a coke. Looking amazed, he told me he had received a call from Boris Yeltsin, asking him to come over to the Russian Federation building and pick up a message. I asked Jim if he would go, while I looked at the unpredictable, agitated crowd of thousands and thousands in his path, he said, of course. Meanwhile, Russian men in the crowd commandeered and toppled buses, pulled up paving stones from the square, used cranes and concrete jersey barriers to construct massive obstacles to all vehicles. We watched them build barricades and learned only later that these were intended to protect the Russian Federation building from armed attacks by the coup leaders. Later in the day, Jim commented to me, Remember, not all coups succeed. Knowing his commitment to optimism, I wasn't sure whether that was his evaluation of events or his attempt to allay my fears. Looking back, I realized how fascinated I was to discover that this is how history actually happens. I learned how uncertain outcomes are at the time of dramatic events, how hard it is to know while you watch what will happen next. Unlike studying history, living through it, you cannot turn to the last page to see how things turn out. Will it become civil war imbued with violence, reaction and counter-reaction? So much that seems obvious later was not known or certain at the time. 
Even what is happening at the time is hard to know at the time. But the abstractness of history, or forces of history, seemed remote while witnessing actual people, people driven by ideas and fears, acting and creating change. After the collapse of the coup, Jim and newly appointed ambassador Robert Strauss met with Yeltsin and Gorbachev as soon as he returned to Moscow. About Gennady Yanayev, it may be a mark of historic change that the hardline communists who ousted Gorbachev to restore the old order were not themselves treated like those they had deemed their enemies over the previous 74 years. The plotters, in 1991, ended up jailed rather than shot or disappeared, and not for long either, months rather than years or lifetimes. For all the analysis these events have generated, I'm still struck by the role of serendipity, the most charming muse of history. The coup leader's failure to capture Yeltsin at the beginning of the coup, the Russians in the CNN satellite tower who disobeyed orders to stop broadcasting, refusing in the face of possible imprisonment to cease transmitting. I discovered then that it is easier to believe film when it imitates reality than reality when it imitates film. It was not until September 11, 2001, that I had that feeling again. As the coup attempt resolved, I returned home to Bethesda, Maryland. About one month later, in late September, I received a call from the American Embassy in Moscow. I knew as soon as I heard a voice that was not Jim's, that bad news would follow. I learned that Jim had suffered a collapsed lung. The good news was that the American Embassy doctor, Paul Grundy, had pressed to admit Jim into one of the three Kremlin hospitals to spare him the grungier conditions of the average Soviet hospital. Jim became the first Western diplomat to be treated at the medical complex that had for years kept alive the Brezhnevs and other major Soviet leaders, with care accorded only to them. The facilities, with their state-of-the-art equipment from Switzerland, Germany, other parts of Europe and the US, impressed the embassy doctor. On admission and during the surgical procedure to puncture his chest, Jim had to do his own interpreting between the American and Russian doctors. Neither spoke the other's language. Along the way, Jim learned the word for lung, liukkoya, lightweight little thing. He didn't find it easy or pleasant to add language interpretation to chest pains and shortness of breath, nor had he ever imagined language would serve as a life or death skill. But there were those who imagined it was symbolic of the collapse of the old Soviet regime, or at least the stresses on Jim's system to cope with so systemic a demise. Although Jim mended well, the Soviet Union and Communist Party did not. A difficult period followed the coup attempt a time of troubles, some called it. The autumn 1991 saw food shortages, U.S. humanitarian relief efforts, with the humiliation that caused, and Gorbachev's desperate efforts to salvage the Soviet Union, to hold it together without the Communist Party, a party no longer in charge after the attempted coup. The empire started to splinter, with the Baltic states breaking away from the Soviet Union and Ukraine approving a referendum on sovereignty. Christmas Day, 1991. Gorbachev signed papers and announced the end of the Soviet Union. The new year opened on 15 newly independent states, in the place the once mighty Soviet Union had stood. Boris Yeltsin, leader of the largest of the states, the Russian Federation, would give the next face of history his name. Now, in this spontaneous new economy, the black marketeers 
who had supplied the privileged classes with imported or scarce goods for hard currency, landed new opportunities. Exploiting their connections and accumulated capital, they acquired government-owned industries for sale or shipped to the West commodities like oil bought at cheap Soviet prices to be sold at world prices for immense profits. They and other instantly rich entrepreneurs with a range of business interests were dubbed the Mafia. The distinction between legitimate and criminal business was not entirely clear. Before 1985, for one dollar, we would receive less than one ruble. In November 1990, I received five or six rubles to a dollar. The previous summer of 1991, it was 25 to 30 rubles to a dollar. Now, in 1992, it was 150 rubles. As acting Prime Minister Yegor Gaidar said, a year ago, Russians had a great deal of money and nothing in the shops to buy. Now the shops are full, but people have no money. For better and worse, the ruble was entering the world currency market. Some people in the US and Russia thought such an economy would solve most problems. Many had not yet begun to worry about the limitations of the free market, especially in addressing inequity, access and support for common services, parks, schools, libraries, healthcare issues, economic volatility, old age. In the balance of gains and losses, one big washout was communist ideology. Although not alone in their search for meaning in the late 20th century, people of the former Soviet Union faced a greater challenge than many in trying to reconnect with the past, reinterpret their culture, and recreate continuity in the midst of a major disconnect. What would fill the ideological vacuum? What historic root would ground capitalism and free enterprise? Before departing Moscow for a few months, I reflected on what I had seen this summer of 92. Reality remained elusive. While elegant shops with designer clothes and cosmetic opened, and construction of private homes mushroomed into suburbs, some old people, probably those without family, sold shoelaces and heirlooms at street corners or markets. In many ways, this was not the same country it had been 27 years before, or even two to five years earlier. But traditions and culture do not metamorphose as quickly as events. People feel disoriented and misplaced. Some people said they felt like immigrants in their own land, foreigners to the place in which they had been born. Five years later, in February 1997, President William Jefferson Clinton selected Jim to be his ambassador to Russia, and on May 30, 1997, the formal nomination was made. I returned to Moscow on January 4, 1998, several months after Jim had settled in. Pressures for economic reform, questions on how loan monies were expended, sales of weapons and advanced military technology to developing countries, paying for the destruction of nuclear weapons, had all been sensitive areas between our two countries in the 90s. Some were more intense than others, but all forced Jim into his role of middleman to communicate, explain and broker differences, not only between some kind of monolithic Russia and monolithic US, but among various representatives of each government, several branches within each government, and the special interests of each. 
the Department of State and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the White House and National Security Council in Washington, the Kremlin and the Belly Dom, White House in Moscow, Congress and the Duma, Cabinet Secretaries in Agriculture, Energy, Commerce and Culture, Military Bureaucracies, Corporate, Business and Religious Groups and Sects, all vying to advance their own interests. Juggling these seemed more an art than science, and beyond any how-to or textbook. For the last few months, the State Department had temporarily assigned two large bodyguards to accompany Jim everywhere, staying in nearby bedrooms at night. This was precaution during NATO's bombings of Serbia. Jim observed, It is understandable, I guess from the Russian point of view. They identify with the Slavic Serbs. When they watch them being bombed, they ask themselves if it could happen here, too. Jim cited, probably from the number of times he had already explained this to others. And Kosovo, in Russia, was never just about Kosovo. It had as much to do with internal politics as international relations. Communists, nationalists and fascists used it to challenge Yeltsin's power, his push to change things, to restructure banking, privatize agricultural land and other assets. It's hard for us to appreciate, but those issues generated as much heat here as our own hot issues do at home. Change. Progress. We think of as positive things. Advancement for the good. But Jim and I thought of how many conversations we had had with Russian friends who felt totally dislocated by the economic transition. Radical change had not been kind to the elderly. Inflation had left middle-aged pensioners penniless. So many trained professionals over 40 or 45 found that support for their careers had been pulled out from under them. Professors found work as lumberjacks, scientists as hairdressers, teachers worked without pay, especially during the earliest transitions in the early 90s. The hope was that ultimately many people would benefit from change, but this rapid transformation of the entire government and economy did not come with a warning label. Caution you will sacrifice a generation or more to get through this period, and history books might omit this forfeiture. While Jim and I returned to Moscow, when he was appointed ambassador to Russia by President Bill Clinton, and I had the chance to observe the evolution of daily life between 1997 and 2001, it seems that a lot was still unsettled. A work in progress, one symbol of larger irresolution was the Russian national anthem. For some seven years, the new anthem had remained music without words, as if the changed land had not yet found its new voice. The music itself was drawn from the past, from Glinka, but the vision for the future, on which the words would be based, was still being sought. Unquote. Thank you for listening. If you would like to have more of this type of content, please consider donating to the PayPal account in the description. It would definitely help keeping it afloat. Don't forget to subscribe, and see you next time.